Good afternoon all. Hello and welcome to Design Timber. My name is Tabitha Binding and I'm Head of Education and Engagement for Timber Development UK. And just a quick shout out, I'd really like to thank the team at Donaldson's Timber Systems in Whitney, who have let me an office to host this webinar from today. So this is a new series to, from Timber Development UK, where we are creating the opportunity to learn directly from the architects and multidisciplinary teams behind four incredible projects. And these projects have been selected from the winners of the Wood Awards in 2021. And today we host the second in our series. Um, but first, a little further information. And then, of course, it doesn't go forward. Okay. So as people come to the room, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Timber Development UK. Timber Development UK has been formed from the merger of the Timber Trade Federation and TRADA. This is an ongoing and exciting project which we hope to realise by the end of this summer. By bringing these two associations together as one, we are creating the largest and most comprehensive supply chain in the UK, spanning from sawmill to specifier to finished product and all points in between. Our mission is for timber to be accepted as the first choice for any sustainable construction project in the UK and the best route to decarbonise the built environment. To do this, we act as an agent of change towards more sustainable, low carbon forms of construction. At the centre of our mission are three main interlinked goals. We are setting out to connect the supply chain through this merger, to lead best practice by building the largest and most comprehensive online library of technical specifications and design guidance, and to accelerate a low carbon future as we support the timber supply chain to lead as a net zero industry. Events like today are crucial to these goals and our missions. So today in the second of the design Timber series, we will hear from the team behind the Welcome Building at RH Garden Bridgewater, who were winners of the Structural Building category in the 2021 Wood Awards. Designed by architects Hodder and Partners and engineers ROC Consulting, the Welcome Building has been described as an important new building that uses the well detailed timber structure as the centerpiece of the architecture. The structural solution provided for, for the necessary long spans and openness, whilst creating a warm and dramatic interior space. And I think visitor numbers have proved that that is true. Um, so in the first half of today's session, we'll hear from um, the design team as they go into detail. We'll follow this up um, with a panellist discussion. And then we'll end up with some Q&A's from the audience. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A button along the screen. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome our speakers. We have architect Stephen Hodder, director at Hodder and Partners, engineer John Smith, design director at ROC Consulting, architect Nick Wright, associated at Hodder and Partners, and project manager Gareth Davis from BAM Construct UK. And um, Stephen, can I ask you to turn on your mic and share your screen, please? Thank you, Tabitha, and uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we're delighted to be uh, uh, talking about the uh, Welcome Building this afternoon. It's been a hugely important project, uh, not just for the team, but also for the Royal Horticultural Society, who in 2015 um, embarked upon a, a 10 year, uh, 160 million pound investment in horticulture to create a more sustainable and better society. And part of that was to um, design a fifth national garden. And they selected a site um, in the Northwest in, in Salford. And this was the uh, site of the former um, Worsley Newhall, 
the uh, seat of the first Earl of Ellesmere. And this was the uh, house designed by um, Edward Bloor, concluded in 1845. Oh, for some reason that's not, bear with me. Right. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, so the 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 house uh, sat um, was demolished after the Second World War, and you can see to the um, the, the 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 top right hand of the the uh, of the screen, Worsley Hall. Um, uh, it sat in the middle of, of 154 acres, um, significantly to the bottom of the screen of the south uh, to the southwest uh, was a wall garden, which which became the focus of the new um, the new garden and this was um, the hall just prior to um, its demolition um, and the drawings which are held in the RIBA's drawing collection uh, by uh, Edward Bloor. He was more uh, well known for designing not the current facade to Buckingham Palace but the previous facade but these are the original drawings of the uh, the hall uh, which is sadly no longer with us. Um, the pork share, um, the, the the entrance, and the gardens um, were, were laid out by a landscape architect called uh, William Nesfield in this very formal style. Um, there'd been many attempts to regenerate the 154 acres. This was um, uh, a, an RIBA organised competition for a hotel on the site of the demolished hall, which which never was never realised. And in 2016, we were invited to compete for the Welcome Builder Welcome Building, which is the um, the visitor center. Um, and this was the site as we then found it with the the lake silted, as I said, the hat, the hall um, no longer there, and the wall garden, um, which, as I said, is the centerpiece of the new garden, really um, overgrown and dilapidated. But there were found elements of the estate. This is the uh, the original gates, now grade two listed. Um, the avenue that led to um, the uh, the main house, um, the Nestfield terraces, um, completely um, overgrown, and the, and the lake, which was now uh, silted and in, in desperate need of, of regeneration. Um, this is the, uh, the Bothy to the north of the wall garden for itinerant workers. And the um, interesting uh, chimney to the former boiler house, which used to heat the uh, the potting sheds that developed that grew the the food foods for the family that lived in the main house. This is the uh, the gardener's cottage, and again a drawing by Bloor of that cottage. And this was a wall garden, quite interesting, um, the second largest wall garden in the country, with this almost hierarchy from the low walls rising to um, the taller walls. And as I said, all there to grow foodstuffs to sustain the family that lived in the, in the house. And a drawing by, uh, again, by Bloor, and quite fascinating social commentary, really, that the, the potting sheds to the north of the garden, you can see were there to grow mushrooms and vines and peaches. Um, all to feed the family. But for us, what was really quite interesting, so this is the site looking towards the west. Um, what was interesting to us was you see the tree line, which defines the Bridgewater Hall, uh, so Bridgewater Canal. That was a really important context uh, for um, the, uh, the Welcome Building. So this was the master plan that was prepared by um, the great landscape architect Tom Stuart Smith, as presented to us at the time of the competition. And you can see the proposal for the wall garden, um, the regeneration of the wall garden and the visitor centre here at the southeast corner. Um, this was our competition uh, entry from 2016, which suggested that really what was needed was a flexible structure um, to allow um, ticketing and gift shop and restaurants to flex with, with the seasons, but then more prescribed areas by way of classrooms and kitchens to be within self-contained buildings, sitting astride inside and outside um, this very flexible umbrella structure. 
in many ways, it was inspired by a sketch by Lord Foster, the great architect Norman Foster, here at the Sainsbury Centre, where he the the design had really open glazed hands looking towards the landscape, and these were um, CGI's that we that Nick Wright, my, my colleague, who's um, on 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 the webinar today, prepared um, uh, to suggest you know what the building could be like, and uh, from an early stage. Uh, the, the notion of using timber was to, um, uh, to capture this idea of the pavilion um, in the park, but also we were really concerned about the quality and the opportunity for prefabrication uh, that timber afforded. And so this is the um, CGI looking south with these uh, glazed ends looking out towards uh, what became the um, outdoor plant sales area and to the north. Um, to the uh, what is now the Welcome Garden and the entrance to the garden. Uh, John's going to talk a little bit more about the development of the structure, but at this time we were thinking of a, um, a portal frame. Uh, it was very much informed by a building we just completed for St. Clair's in Oxford, where we had used um, uh, glue lamb portal frames um, in this art studio um, with CLT. Um, again, because of this consideration for um, prefabrication, and you can hopefully see the connection here between um, the very early image that we had for the uh, the Welcome Building at the time of the competition. And this is a, a view, uh, a nighttime shot of uh, of that competition entry. This is the final master plan. The um, the the we. Um, uh, the welcome building sitting here at the um, southeast corner of the wall garden. We had terrible ground conditions, organic matter beneath the ground, which were a real, um, again, great consideration in terms of thinking about the structure, how it might likely sit in the ground. And, and this was wor as work started with the wall garden now uh, cleared and restoration of the, of the enclosing walls, the cleared Nestfield terraces, the lake, drained, ready for regeneration. And this is the final drawing, which hopefully you can see the connection to the competition entry. This very flexible space um, with um, the uh, classrooms, offices and kitchen and plant room all sort of contained uh, in their own building, sitting inside and outside the uh, overarching umbrella roof. And these were the final CGIs. And I think that as the design developed, um, I think we came to recognise that in support of the RHS's sustainable uh, policy, um, the sustainability policy, that not only was the issues of prefabrication and this notion of the building being uh, in the garden important, uh, the roof structure, we uh, sequesters um, 320 tonnes of carbon, uh, the cladding a further 28 tonnes of carbon. Um, so again, this was, as the design was developing, a realisation um, the underpinning all of this was a really um, a, um, a very positive approach, not only to the, the RHS sustainable uh, policy, but also to the um, uh, net zero ambitions of Salford City Council. And these are the final um, CGI's um, looking, this is looking west over um, the New Lake. And I, I touched on this earlier, the important context for us looking uh, west along the meadow with the striking horizon of the tree-lined uh, Bridgewater Canal uh, and the CGI that was produced at that time showing how the building was very much responding to that sort of horizontal horizon, never rising above uh, the tree line of the canal. And these were a couple of uh, CGI's of the uh, interior interrogation um, um, of the, uh, the final design solution. This one, looking back to the entrance to the uh, garden itself uh, with these uh, self-contained buildings sitting inside and outside. And this diagram before I hand over to John really tries to capture uh, not only uh, is the timber supporting uh, the approach to carbon within the building, um, but we, but with using natural um, uh, natural cross ventilation by using ground source heat pumps, bringing water up from the ground at ten degrees C, cooling the building in summer, uh, heating the building. Eighty percent of the heating in the building is from the ground source heat pump, uh, ground source heat uh, heat pumps, and also uh, using uh, wildflower on the roof to improve the biodiversity and ecology. Um, of, the, uh, of, of the building and its contribution to the site. 
And at that point, I'm going to hand over to John, who will go uh, now um, in a lot more into the detail before I come back and show you images of the completed building. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you to the Timber Alum UK for inviting me to talk today. Uh, so as has been mentioned, what I'd like to talk to you about is a little bit more about the actual development of the structural design for the roof, um, taking it through from concept to site. Um, share my screen. So as you can see, the, the welcome building actually has quite a simple form. It consists of three predominant components. Uh, there's a polished concrete floor, a, a timber and glass facade, and uh, the timber diagrid roof. And uh, these combine to form one large open plan space. Um, as Stephen's already touched upon, the back of house areas, the kitchen, the offices, the classrooms, are all housed in bespoke pod structures that sit below the main building and are structurally independent from it. Um, so this, it looks to be quite a simple structure, um, but actually the structural design of the roof was quite complex. And um, this sort of deceptive simplicity, I think, is derived from a collaborative design process whereby we progressively refined and optimised the form of the roof uh, to create a much more materially efficient design and, and yet something that was much more elegant. Um, the starting point for the structural design of the roof was the aspiration to create a large column tree space. Um, and aligned with this was the requirement to use timber as the primary structural material to meet both the architectural and the environmental ambitions. And this is actually achieved uh, by supporting the roof with 16 branching tree columns, uh, creating an overarching structure spanning 24 metres by 90 metres. Uh, the columns are provided on a 12 metre by 12 metre grid and consist of 400 millimetre diameter in situ reinforced concrete trunks and four glue lamb branches that support the roof. The columns themselves are supported on piled foundations tied together with a pile graft slab. Uh, the roof structure comprises a grillage of primary beams at six metre centres. Uh, so you can see the, the primary beams spanning transversely across the building, uh, but they also span longitudinally as well. Um, with secondary beams at three metre centres, and then a, a tertiary uh, grid of arrangements that create the diagrid uh, appearance. It didn't start out looking like this. Um, so as Stephen's already touched on, the initial idea was uh, to have a portal frame structure. Um, <clears throat> the problem we found with this though is uh, that the size of the portal frames required was quite significant to achieve the 24 meter uh, clear span. Um, unfortunately, whilst timber is quite a light material, when you compare it to structural steel, in terms of strength and stiffness, um, you need more of it to create the same uh, arrangement, which is why obviously, when we looked at the portal for a solution, the, the size of the elements was quite significant. And even using flitch beams to reduce the depth, I think it was still considered uh, that it wasn't quite uh, slender and elegant enough. So um, what we started to do was we looked at ways in which we could reduce that 24 meter span in order to make the, uh, the structure lighter and more elegant. Uh, so we considered um, introducing knee braces to prop the corners of the portal. Um, we looked at bringing the portal columns in uh, in order to reduce the main span. Um, uh, we looked at the idea of uh, branching uh, Y columns. And for all of these options, uh, what we were doing was we were using uh, 3D visualizations within Revit 
to try and get a better feel for how the finished structure would look. Um, and then we come on to the final solution. So the, the, the Y-shaped column idea was developed. Um, first, the columns were inset, uh, basically brought into the building and, and positioned at the span at the quarter points to effectively create a, a balanced cantilever arrangement. Um, and then we did that in two directions. So as well as in setting the columns from the sides, we positioned columns halfway between uh, the rafters. So a 2D Y column became the 3D uh, uh, tree column. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and uh, by actually applying the same balanced cantilever concept in the longitudinal direction, two rafters can be supported by a single pair of columns halfway between them. Uh, thereby halving the total number of columns required. So hopefully you can see from this early image uh, that you have the columns positioned halfway between the main rafters, but they're only every other bay. So you've got this balanced cantilever arrangement all around. So in the end, we have a say, a very large and open column grid within the building. Um, obviously whilst timber is a lightweight material, I think the structural challenge wasn't helped by the fact that there was this aspiration to put a green roof on there. Um, so we, we obviously needed to consider quite carefully the weight of this. And uh, for initial uh, design purposes, we looked at a, a, a Bowder extensive green roof system uh, with a saturated weight of 264 kilograms a meter square. Um, and in the final design, uh, what we ended up with doing was we put this green roof above the columns so that the, we avoided loading up the areas which were away from uh, uh, the columns. Obviously, having uh, developed a uh, primary frame structure, we then went through a similar process in terms of developing uh, the diagrid looking at a number of different alternative configurations. Uh, so the initial arrangement was a three meter by one and a half meter diamond pattern with secondary beams at six meter centers. Uh, this was then, we then introduced the secondary beams at three meter centers. Same diagram arrangement, but lighter elements because they're spanning less far. Um, and the secondary beams are smaller because it's more open. Uh, we then looked at a slightly wider diamond, which is a three meter by two meter pattern. Um, we then looked at a, a, a square diamond on a two meter square pattern. And then, the, and then the final arrangement that was the one that was taken forward to tend the construction was a, a three meter square diamond pattern. And I think the conclusion was with the, the, the secondary elements, the, the square pattern worked better and coordinated better with the glazing to the roof light and the other areas. And by opening up the diagrid, making it larger, gave us a, 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 a cleaner, less cluttered uh, finish to the structure. Um, the roof sheeting itself, uh, we looked at a number of different options, uh, including uh, timber cassettes, CLT panels, and LVL. Uh, the final solution that was developed was a CLT. Uh, board. Um, and like we did with the primary frame, uh, we used 3D visualizations uh, when we were looking at the different uh, arrangements for the diagram, again, to help uh, give us a feel of what the, what the different options might look like. Yeah. So apologies, I'm going to get a little bit technical now, but I couldn't resist doing a, a, a bit of a techie bit in there. Um, so the biggest challenge for us was actually making this structure stable. Uh, and to achieve a stable structure with this arrangement, the columns had to, be act, had to be designed to act as vertical cantilevers from the pile foundations. And the roof structure had to be designed as continuous in both directions. Um, the pin connections, at the end of the column branches and the hit and miss, the hit and miss arrangement of columns 
meant that continuity in the roof structure was essential to providing stability. Uh, we did obviously look at a number of different uh, options at this stage. We considered tying uh, the columns together, but that was felt to be too visually intrusive. We also considered using the facade structure to prop the edges of the roof and um, provide stability that way. Um, but that was discounted uh, due to the, the complexities that there would be of trying to mix the structure to the roof with the structure to the facade. And also it wasn't particularly consistent with the idea of flexibility in terms of the pod structures moving in and out. Um, so eventually we just came up with the concept we just make the roof continuous. Uh, the reliance on moment continu continuity, however, resulted in quite a flexible structure, um, which combined with a three meter cantilever to the edges, meant that careful consideration of the building movement was required where the roof interfaced with the facade. Um, so this, in the end, was addressed via careful modeling uh, at the detailed design stage of the in-service deflections and providing for that movement in the head detail at the facade interface. Um, additionally, as I already mentioned, the green roof was restricted to the strips above the tree columns, uh, minimizing the dead load applied to the cantilever roof areas. Um, obviously, as the moment continuity was critical for stability, it was essential that we looked at the design of the connections as well as the members. Uh, and this was needed at an early stage of the design process, because often in timber design, it can be the connection design that actually drives the element sizing. Um, so to achieve the required moment capacity, a dowel connection was developed, utilizing steel dowels to transfer shear, bending and axial forces from the glue lamb rafters into a pair of steel connection plates flitched into the end of the section. And uh, there was a, obviously there's an evolution in the connection design as well. So this image shows uh, some early indicative connection types, um, which was then developed further as we got into uh, detailed design. Um, this image here also illustrates some more about the hierarchy of elements within the structure in terms of the primary transverse beams uh, that span across the building. The primary longitudinal beams, which are the ones with the threes next to them, and then the secondary longitudinal beams, which are the twos, and then obviously the tertiary diagram. Um, obviously, this is a, a, an image for some of the detail for the glue lamb tree branches produced at tender. Uh, and by this stage, we'd obviously also looked at refining the branches themselves making them cigar shaped as opposed to straight cylinders, again, to improve the elegance. And uh, finally, we've got some images there of the sort of the finished uh, connection details. So I'm so just conscious of time, so I'll just uh, rattle through the next bit very quickly. Um, so the initial design proposed a piecemeal approach to the fabrication where each timber member would be erected and fixed on site. Um, the problem with this approach was large numbers of complex moment connections were required where the primary raft is intersected at the head of each support. And it would also needed a lot of temporary works and working at height to uh, effectively assemble the roof in situ. Um, so we took some initial consultation with a specialist timber frame contractor and we developed an alternative approach uh, sort of predicated around the idea of off-site prefabrication in a factory. Um, the idea being is that the roof would be pre-assembled in six meter by three meter modules um, in, in the factory. These would then be brought to site and then you would assemble these into six meter by 24 meter bays and those bays would be um, erected uh, in in, in one piece effectively. So the first, the, the first slide sort of shows the different cassette types that you would see within one half bay. Uh, and then the, the second outlines the sort of the construction sequence, if you like, in terms of the concept of uh, pre-assembly on the ground, 
before lifting into position. And then finally, you've got the construction sequence itself. Uh, and then because obviously, again, because of the hit and miss nature, there's a requirement to um, erect on a hit and miss basis with the sort of intermediate bays being infilled only once you've got two bays either side. And this uh, approach, I think, was largely adopted by the, by the specialist contractor at, ten, at construction stage, although uh, I think they took a slightly more piecemeal approach to it with a greater on-site assembly, but essentially retaining the principles of pre-assembly on the ground and erecting the structure on a bay-by-bay -bay basis. And just to finish, uh, I would like to share with you some of the, 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 the specialist timber contractors drawings. Um, so the, 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 the at construction stage, it was Hess who were appointed by BAM to do the uh, final design and detailing of the frame. Um, very impressed with the work that they did. Um, impeccable intention to detail, I felt, and the, and the quality of their fabrication drawings was, was something else. Um, so you've got a typical GA there and some images of the typical drawings for a, a, a tree a column base detail and a, and a tree column branch detail. And there's an incredible amount of detail on those drawings that were provided. And, and as, well as, um, as well as having a really good impressive knowledge of designing and working with timber, I think the other really impressive thing about Hess was just the, the construction accuracy and the fact that they were able to produce everything to literally within two or three millimeters of tolerance, which is much better than you would expect with uh, steel or concrete frame construction. And to finish, I've just got a few images of the construction. And there you can see uh, a bay being installed. Um, here you can see that they're starting to put the intermediate members in. Um, the only problem with the bay by bay method is effectively that whole bay has to remain on the crane hook until they've got some intermediate members in to stabilize it. Um, but yeah, uh, I, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a great project to be involved with. And uh, I think the timber contractor did an excellent job uh, delivering the designs that we developed in conjunction with Stephen Hodder and his team. Um, and, you know, just to conclude, I think for us, I mean, it was a fantastic project to work on and it was a unique opportunity to create visually stunning yet simple and honest structure working in a collaborative process with the architect and also with the specialist and the contractor. And I'll hand you back to Stephen on that point. Uh, Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to, uh, can you, yeah. Um, I'm just going to, before we open it up to uh, q and I'm just going to conclude now uh, with showing you some uh, images of the, um, of the completed project. Um, just... Um, So this is uh, um, a, an image to taken um, from from the southeast corner of the completed building, um, with the um, outdoor terrace overlooking the lake and this um, folding roof um, that um, envelops the whole building, looking back towards the regenerated wall garden um, and the um, and, and the car park. I think as John said, and, and I think one of the overarching messages here is that you know, to deliver a building like this requires an incredible amount of coordination uh, and collegiality between um, not only the design team, but working with, with Gareth and Bam um, and the most wonderful client. I mean, it's been quite an extraordinary project to work uh, work on and a building which has now won 13 awards. It's quite, quite remarkable. So this is the um, a, a view of the building as you approach um, the entrance um, with the admin officers on the left um, and to the right, uh, the, the glass house, um, single glazed, um, 
um, uh, and try and thinking about how to buffer this from the uh, the main interior was quite an interesting challenge um, with the, the roof extending both to the north and the south, not only to create that sort of interplay between inside and outside, but really just to extend the visitor's view out towards the garden. So this is at the north end. And here from what is known as a welcome garden, um, looking south with the uh, classroom pod in the, in the foreground. You see how um, at the cladding, which is in large, we use a, a, a array of um, large louvers then to uh, attenuate uh, extremes in, in temperature uh, in the summer. But this is looking from uh, the north now along the main uh, axis back towards the, uh, uh, the gateway to the garden. And here the view across the new lake. Um, a detail of so this that glazed area is directly opposite the entrance so as you enter the building you get the view uh, that long distance view um along along the meadow and a view looking towards the uh, outdoor uh, restaurant terrace uh, with this folding down canopy which um, provides shelter in inclement weather it does rain now and again in manchester as you probably know um, and a little detail of the uh, outdoor um, plant sale, uh, the, uh, uh, the glass house and the outdoor plant sales area. Um, and then this is just takes you through a promenade from the, um, um, the outdoor plant sales area, how the roof folds down to mitigate solar gain um, on, on that south elevation. Um, moving into uh, the indoor plant sales. And you can see, hopefully, the point that I was making earlier and the inspiration of the Foster image that you can see right through the building, the tremendous visual transparency, not just helping to navigate people through the building, but so it's very clear as to how you um, um, enter um, the, the garden itself. Um, a, a detail of the, the roof structure extends uh, over the glass house uh, and then again, uh, climatic conditions in there con uh, controlled by an array of blinds. And I think, uh, you know, John has, ex has, uh, has expressed it. I think in, in a way we, with all the activity that goes on beneath, whether it be the membership area or the retail area or the restaurant, the idea always was, was that you would have this um, overarching umbrella roof of um, a much finer grain with a hierarchy of members, uh, as John has expressed, rather than the very heavy, portal frame structure, which wouldn't have given that sort of very evenness and very calmness and the very fine detail um, that we now have. So this is looking back towards the kitchen pod and the, uh, the servery with the, uh, you get this wonderful quality of, of, of light coming through the main central uh, uh, triple glaze roof light that runs down the building um, and a detail of the, um, the junction of the, um, the branches to the uh, concrete trunks of the trees. A detail of the um, the louvers. Sorry, um, and then the nighttime shot and the all of the 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 servicing. You can see that there was um, uh, uh, flint uh, uh, plates that connect the structural bays, but then we use that um, also to um, carry services throughout the roof structure to connect to the fire protection systems and, and lighting. Um, but then, as I said at the outset, uh, the building is very much about a pavilion in the garden and not only responding to the horizon um, of the uh, Bridgewater Canal, but also here uh, from the wall garden. Um, with this almost layering of the, the garden wall and the building floating over it. And here, everywhere, there is reference to the, the building as a gateway to the garden here from what's known as a Chinese stream, streamside garden. And really, the, the, this brings me back to the, um, the one of the very early slides that uh, the agenda, the really strong driver, aside from the, the selection of timber, was, was this building which sits in you know, a very horizontal composition uh, within the meadow um, set against the backdrop of the tree-lined Bridgewater Canal. 
And that concludes the presentation. So I'm going to hand back to you now, Tabitha, for uh, for, for Q and A. <laughs> Thank you, um, Stephen and John. Oh, fantastic building. I so want to go and visit it. It's just, it looks absolutely amazing. Can I ask um, Garrison, Nick, and well, actually, all of you to turn on your um, on your microphones? Um, and what you, you talked about so many things, you talked about carbon, you talked about energy, you talked about flexibility of the space, um, but actually it really comes across as teamwork. And I think before, as we were chatting, you know, beforehand, it came, you know, that's, you all know each other, you all just can pick up the phone. It was, it was so lovely to hear. But I think I'd like to put a sort of a question towards Gareth. So it's a really complex hybrid building, Gareth, and I'm sure you went, no problem. Absolutely. You know, this is design, you know, turn it on tomorrow. But so, so obviously it's a huge building, 90 metres by 24 metres. I mean, what were the most sort of challenging sort of aspects of, of this building? I, I think, uh, thank you for inviting me along today, uh, Tabitha. Um, I think the, the, the challenging aspects are probably uh, one, the tolerances that we needed to achieve to ensure that the uh, the the, the, the diagram frame when it was uh, offered up to the first grids actually uh, for first column sorry actually fitted on uh, there was absolutely no tolerance to those um, the holding down bolts which were cast into the top of the columns and had the the, the sort of um, tolerance has been exceeded there the whole geometry of the building would have uh, thrown itself out across the 90 meters of the building and it would be probably very difficult to bring it all back in line so that was the first uh, uh, difficulty if you like but i think it's testimony to the team and i think our understanding of what was required out there because there was a lot of uh, um, design development and design meetings held. So I think everybody understood what the requirements and the vision and, and, and the expectations were. And uh, I think from a contractor's point of view, uh, that the roof in itself is, is a piece of furniture and is the main feature of the building. Uh, and when delivered uh, by Hess, the one thing that we had to do is ensure that we had to have flat, clean uh, lay down areas to accept it and indeed erect these cassettes um once they once they were erected and there were some temporary works issues as john alluded to for the first section that went on and it was worked through uh, every department and worked very well but once the once the roof started to be uh constructed we have the central roof light there which is i think off memory around about 50 50 or 55 meters long by about six meters wide so it, and, and, and the greenhouse at the end which obviously had large sections of the roof open to the elements. 80% uh, of the roof was covered by the, the, the CLT uh, and we, we had some temporary uh, weatherproofing to the joints there. So we had that covered, but our concerns were that we, we, we could potentially have shading um, on, the, on the roof lights and the, uh, the greenhouse, which would have been uh, extremely disappointing on the, on the overall finish. So we tried many ways of, of uh, protection. One was very early days was there was a suggestion that we had this product which you could spray a protective plastic covering on it and then remove it quite easily. Uh, we thankfully did a sample on that on a piece of glue land that we had as a sample. Um, and I have to say that if we had have sprayed that frame with that plastic uh, component, we'd probably be still there now trying to peel it off. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there was lots of, uh, lots of uh, challenges to keep it. The, the main concern for us was water um, holding in the connections and staying there for a period of time, um, which meant a lot of attendances for Visqueen. And as Stephen alluded to earlier on, we do get a lot of rain up in Salford and Manchester, and that was one big consideration to make. Um, but we, we did, I think the lessons learned on that would have been, for me now, would have been to sort of really get the, the glazed uh, roof light uh, a lot earlier, even on site before, the frames had actually started to be erected. And that would have given us a lot of comfort, saved a lot of time and effort. Um, that's not to say that we didn't have some uh, water staining in some areas, but that was sort of uh, dealt with uh, through HESS, um, uh, through using the same materials and what have you. So the, 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 the finished uh, roof is testimony to that, I think, of, of maintaining that piece of furniture, uh, as I alluded to before. Thanks, Gareth. I love the fact you're calling it, yeah, furniture. It's like, yeah, 
yeah, well, why not? Nick, would yeah. you like to add anything to that? Um, tricky to add to that, really. <laughs> um, there's been a question about fire. Um, I don't know whether you want to touch on on the fire protection, uh, not just in terms of means of escape, but also the protection of the roof. Uh, yeah, I can talk about fire. Um, at first, sort of specification time, we we had specified um, a surface spread of flame treatment to the entire roof and all the timber, all the internal areas. And um, I think we quickly realized working with Gareth and BAM that that would be a mammoth task. Uh, and then you've got all your connections and all the sort of intricacies that it would become quite difficult. But the, the nature of the space being so flexible and open meant that um, the only sort of area of any significant fire hazard was the commercial kitchen, which is its own self-contained uh, pod, which is block work structure. So um, we managed to, through fire engineering, emit the flame treatment in, uh, and instead do a 60-minute um, a compartment around that kitchen. And also um, the, there's the, um, the natural ventilation that Stephen spoke about, uh, high and low level. Uh, all of those are actually on actuators linked to the, um, the fire alarm as well, so they're smoke ventilation. So it's a fire engineered approach to, to avoid having to, to coat all of the timber. And what about uh, thermal breaks, uh, Nick, between inside and outside? Uh, well, generally speaking, for the majority, for the length, there's um, cladding um, and insulation running up the external face so that there isn't actually a problem there. Um, on the ends where we've got fully glazed and um, we worked with Hess and there's isolations in there. No, brilliant. So moisture, moisture and fire are always come into, you know, the question when you're using timber and, and obviously, you know, the tolerances and that's, you know, again, really here and interesting to hear how, how they, they, they came to get, you know, came together and by working with your specialist timber contractor and then listening to them and also understanding where you needed, you know, flat areas and areas to store, store, you know, material before it was installed has, you know, is, has made this happen. We have had, yeah. Quite a lot of questions in um you know feel welcome to if you want to pop your answers in you know type an answer please do um again we're sort of coming back to how how um you know promoting the use of timber um so here i've got one here for the branches how does the shaping process affect the properties of the you know the the, the sections so you talked about john i think the it made it more elegant, but obviously it didn't change the structural strength of the members. No, so the, obviously the structural design of the elements considered uh, the tapered section in terms of uh, section capacity. Um, in terms of the compression, obviously you've got cross-sectional area and buckling to consider. Uh, obviously, the buckling is helped by the fact it's fatter at the middle and thinner at the ends. So the critical thing is the cross-sectional area at the ends. Uh, but there, obviously, you've got the connection detail itself with the steel plates splitched into the end of the element that help to strengthen the element. So these are all things that have to be considered in the detailed design very carefully. Um, but they are obviously addressed through the, through the, through the calculation process that's done. Uh, for both the element design and the connection design. I think I should add, Tabitha, that, uh, which I didn't mention in, in my part of the presentation, that at the time of the competition, we'd been to see uh, a number of the visitor centres that within the RHS portfolio. And I think, you know, what we see is, what we found was that obviously in some of us, you know, the plant material um, is, 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 um, uh, dominates, but then at times of Christmas, inevitably, you know, there are gifts and so on. And there, there was a need that those those business centres were not able to sort of seasonally flex. So that was in many ways the generator for this was was for this overarching structure in which you know the three spaces, the membership, the uh, the retail, and the restaurant could could actually flex. But of course, allied to that then was really the need to minimise the number, given that, as, as John said, you know, we're talking about a structure which is 90 by 24, was to minimise the number of columns. 
um, so that that you know contributes to the flexibility of the building and you know therefore future proofs the building. I mean, there's, another, there's that other aspect of of um, sustainability, not just in turban, not just in terms of its carbon footprint, but trying to future proof it and 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 allow it to you know not to become obsolete over the over the future years. Well, I'm hearing that it's so successful that uh, the future proofing needs to have almost extended already. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I saw in the chat box. I mean, we, the building's now been open uh, uh, just a year, um, and 500, half a million visitors have passed through that building in the past year. The building's the, the garden is actually operating at year eight levels, and it's now Wisley, which is the RHS's flagship. This is now number two in their portfolio. It's been quite quite extraordinary. We'd like to think it's because of the building, of course, not the garden. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think to that, Gary? Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and we did ask um, John Pye from the RHS, uh, the, the garden, I think he was your client, but he said he was just up to his eyes dealing with visitors. <laughs> He's a absolutely brilliant, brilliant client. Um, so, so on that point, obviously, so when we come to use timber, like, uh, have you got any tips? You know, so when you're say work, what you've learned on this project, what could you take away from it as timber knowledge to work, you know, work on your next project where you'll use timber? I, I think uh, for me, the, 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 the 22 weeks, I think that we had for design development and fabrication with Hess and the, the design development meetings with John and Hess and Nick and Stephen uh, were invaluable uh, and that, that, that proved to be uh, the, the, or, or was the success of the building, I think. Um, that is the, the, the be all end all for me. Actually putting it up and, and on one of you is pretty straightforward, but it's, it's, that, it's that understanding and, and, and design uh, interface with everybody, uh, which is extremely important. I think I would agree with Gareth. I think Hess's input was essential to delivering the aspiration. Yes. Um, you know, they because they are a specialist in timber, it's what they do, it's, it's their bread and butter. Uh, they were able to bring that extra level of expertise to the design process uh, that perhaps we didn't have ourselves. And I think also, I think also recognizing that you you know you you're working with a live material here, you know, and and that um, you you know you have to allow, even though yes, the tolerances were very fine, you do have to, and and clearly, you know, the nature of the structure is such that certainly at the eaves we were having to deal with movement. It's just to accept that when you're detailing it, that you do allow for that that movement. Um, it took a great deal of coordination from from everyone, um, and you you realize that. Um, as we develop design, of course, it's a very long building as well. You'll find that there's not a single, in terms of the width of the plank, there isn't a single cut plank along the, in that length of the building. Um, and, and everything was coordinated. It, it, so whilst we talk about the 12 metre grid of columns or the six metre grid of the, um, of, of the cassettes, um, in fact, the, the, the detailing was almost, was down to the width of each plank. Um, and it took a remarkable piece of coordination from everybody. I'd, I'd agree with that, Stephen. The, the, the cladding in every sense is not like traditional cladding as we know it in, in construction. Uh, even the detailing back to the curtain walling and connections, which John had a lot of uh, input on the connections back with the curtain walling contractor. And indeed the joinery contractor that carried out the, uh, the, uh, the external cladding um, as a joinery contractor, I think, and understanding that every vertical board was a full board all the way down the length of the 90 meters was again testimony I think to everybody's understanding of of of, of what what was required on the details I think and that was important and it goes back to echoing what you talked about it's like a piece of furniture and yeah and with furniture you don't get the details wrong do you? <laughs> yes <laughs> I know it is four minutes to um, four minutes to two, and I know we've all got busy lives to carry on with. Um, I'm just going to. The, there is quite a few questions in the chat. If you want to answer any of them, just by typing in, please, please do so. Um, let me share screen again. 
There's a question, Tabitha, about other modes of transport. Uh, it's not strictly the subject we're talking about, but uh, obviously we there is um, the car parking, but of course a part of the um, sustainability strategy together with the city, uh, Salford City Council, um, at the entrance there was a, a, a new a, a new bus lay-by, but also there's a huge amount of um, cycle provision um, on, on the site and cycleways. And again, together with the city, they've augmented the cycleways along the canal. Um, but also um, we there's quite a, a significant amount of, uh, uh, of EV uh, spaces within the, um, within the car park as, as well. I know in these like one hour webinars, we really don't have enough time to touch, touch on everything all the same. So a huge thank you today for giving up your time and coming talking to us more about it. So Stephen and John and Gareth and Nick. And if you have a building that you would like to enter into the Wood Awards, um, it closes on the 1st of July 2022. Um, so please go online at thewoodawards.com and um, enter. And I'd like to, if you enjoy today, please make sure you sign up to our next Design Timber session, which we'll be focusing on the Wood Annex on the 13th of July, 2022. Um, you can sign up via Eventbrite. Um, I think we're on time. So gentlemen, huge, huge, huge thank you. And to our audience for giving up their time today to listen as you talked about the team sort of um, bringing this fabulous building together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.